Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to MaxMin uh, 2024. The last talk uh, today will be by uh, PhD student Jonathan Balassingham, also in our group, who will talk about accelerating material property prediction using generically complete isometry invariants. Please, Jonathan. Thank you, Vitaly. Um, so today we're going to be talking about some of the research that we published um, earlier this year. Um, and just as a brief overview, uh, our goal with this, this uh, project was to apply supervised learning to predict the properties of crystal structures. And uh, our contribution was a model, a transformer-based model that could do exactly that. Um, and it provided accuracy on par with uh, state-of-the-art results while being several times faster um, in terms of training speed and prediction time. Um, so more formally, uh, supervised learning is, is the process of of given a set of crystals um, and some scalar property values specifically um, that are invariant to rotation translation. Um, we want to find some parameterized function f sub theta such that we minimize the mean absolute error between the predictions uh, that we provide and the true property values. Um, so why do we want to do this? Um, well, our main motivation is that the typical way that you do crystal property prediction is using density functional theory, um, but DFT methods have two main problems. First and foremost, they're very computationally expensive. So high throughput prediction predictions for, for large quantities of materials are, are just not feasible. Um, and the second problem is that you have to use different pseudo potentials for different types of materials. Um, and in order to use DFT effectively, you have to have quite extensive domain knowledge. Um, so it's it's less accessible than say uh, machine learning methods. Um, and while supervised learning methods have, have uh, improved over the course of years and actually become quite accurate, um, they still have uh, a few problems. Um, the first and foremost uh, is that they are typically graph-based. So you construct a graph to represent a periodic crystal, and then you use this graph in, in a graph neural network. Um, the most accurate methods use line graphs. So uh, a graph derived from the original graph. Uh, in the original graph, vertices will represent atoms, edges will represent pairwise distances. But in line graphs, you have a vertex corresponding to each edge in the original graph. And uh, in, in the first line graph, these, these vertices will represent pairwise distances. Um, and then the edges will represent uh, angular information. Um, so you're incorporating more and more geometric information. But the problem is these line graphs are substantially larger than the graphs that they're derived from. So you're essentially improving accuracy, but, but significantly slowing down. Um, your your prediction and training times. Um, and then the second problem is that atomic perturbations can cause significant changes in the graph's topology. Uh, most graphs are constructed using either a cutoff radius or a K nearest neighbor. So if you have an atom move in and out of this cutoff radius or change places with another atom for that last neighbor, then this tiny little change in, in uh, atomic placement can actually result in a change of the prediction um, that could be quite large. Um, so instead of using graph neural networks, we're going to be using transformers. Um, and the difference, the, the most important difference here is that graph neural networks take graphs as input. Um, so you need to construct a graph that, that represents a crystal structure. Transformers operates uh, operate on sets um, or in, in, in a different interpretation, uh, fully connected graphs, but always fully connected graphs um, for each item within the set. Um, so in our interpretation of things, we each uh, each element of this set is either an atom or a group of atoms. And uh, we'll discuss in a little bit what, uh, what uh, atoms are grouped together. Um, but first, uh, kind of like the backbone of our geometric information uh, that we're going to use as input for our model comes from the pointwise distance distribution. Uh, I'm sure this has been presented earlier today, um, but I'll quickly go through it. Uh, the PDD is just a matrix where every row corresponds to an atom in the unit cell. The first entry is the weight, which is typically assigned to one over the number of atoms in the unit cell. And then you have the K nearest neighbor distances following um, in increasing order. Um, so once this matrix is formed, you can find rows that have the same K nearest neighbor distances and then collapse them into a single row and, and sum their weights. Um, and while the PDD has all the geometric information that we could want, um, the 
we have two sort of problems. Um, first, how do we incorporate compositional information into this? There's no there's no concept of whether this row corresponds to a particular type of, of atomic element. Um, so uh, we just don't know what's what's uh, what the actual crystal is made up of. Um, and the second thing is when we're collapsing rows and grouping rows, essentially grouping atoms uh, together, uh, how do we prevent two rows that correspond to different types of atoms but have the same carrying nearest neighbors uh, from being group being grouped together because it's grouping those two together and then uh, inputting this set into a, a transform model it will result in significant loss of information. Um, so the way we do that is with the periodic set transformer. So this is kind of an overview of the model. Uh, we have two inputs, the PDD and then the atomic composition. Um, and then we combine this information uh, doing something we call PDD encoding. Uh, once this is done and we've sort of mixed the structural and the compositional information together, we pass it through a pretty standard uh, multi-headed tension that's altered to take into consideration uh, the weights of the PDD. Um, and then we pull all these individual uh, embeddings together, uh, reincorporating the PDD weights, uh, turning our individual embeddings uh, within fr from the set into a single uh, vector, which is representative of the uh, crystal as a whole. This is then passed through a multi-layered perceptron and then we get our property value. Um, so kind of where the magic happens here is during this PDD encoding portion of things. Um, so obviously we have the PDD, uh, which has several rows that correspond to either an atom or a set of atoms. And then for each set of atoms or atom, uh, we have its atomic uh, species. Um, so what we do here is essentially combine the two. So first we take a particular uh, PDD row um, and pass it through a single layer perceptron. And then we take this atomic embedding, which is just a vector which uh, gives information about the atomic species. So this can be something as simple as a one hot encoded vector of the atomic number, uh, all the way to individual properties, uh, such as electronegativity or, or the number of protons for a specific element. Um, and these two are each passed through a single layer perceptron to make sure that the dimensionality matches and they are summed together. Um, if you're familiar with natural language processing, this is kind of a very similar thing to, to taking a word embedding and then adding positional encoding there. Um, and this is parameterized by, by two, two values, uh, K, which is uh, a value for the PDD, the number of nearest neighbors to use, and then the collapse tolerance, which is the largest difference between any two K nearest neighbor distances to allow those two uh, atoms to be considered the same. Um, and then we're also going to use two different types of attention mechanisms. Um, the, the actual formulas are, are less important here, but uh, what is important to know is that dot product attention, which is kind of the standard attention mechanism, um, in dot product attention, attention weights are scalars um, that indicate kind of the importance of one element of the set to another element in the set. Um, and then we have vector attention, which is more granular. Um, attention weights are vectors in this case. And uh, while they indicate importance from one uh, element in the set to another element in the set, they do so more granularly. granularly. Um, they in indicate importance at the individual feature level. So if we go back, um, a, a scalar attention weight and dot product attention would have this particular embedding have a particular attention weight, which is a scalar assigned to others in the set. Whereas in vector attention, each one of these features would have uh, an attention weight assigned to it for each of the other elements in the set uh, and their individual features. Um, so we did experiments using three data sets. Uh, we have uh, a set of simulated molecular crystals, all of these um, here. So each one of these represents a crystal with a particular composition and all and uh, the crystals within the data set just have the arrangement change, but they're all compositionally homogenous. Um, and then we use the materials project, which is just a very common um, set of inorganic materials that, that's commonly used to benchmark uh, uh, property prediction models. And then Jarvis DFT, which is a, it's a subset of the materials project and it has some crystals from the ICSD um, recomputed uh, with recomputed properties. Um, so it includes the properties provided in the materials project, uh, recomputed with a different DFT method, but it also has additional properties as well.
Um, so for our first set of experiments, uh, we wanted to compare just the performance of using the PDD alone with another invariant, uh, average minimum distance. Um, and in the average, average minimum distance model, uh, Gaussian regression is used. And for our model, we just take the PDD and instead of adding the uh, atomic composition, we just pass the PDD in directly to, to our transformer model. Um, so in the first uh, uh, experiment here, we have the training set, which consisted only of the T2 crystals, and then the testing set also consists of uh, a subset of this of this data set with just the T2 crystals. And as you can see, the PDD uh, outperforms average minimum distance. This shouldn't be surprising as the PDD has strictly more information than, than average minimum distance. Um, in the second experiment, we add in two more sets of crystals, the P1 and S2, and then we also have a testing set, a testing set uh, co comprised of, of the same uh, uh, crystals. And you can see here that the PDD still outperforms, but to a lesser degree, um, the average minimum distance. Um, and then in the final experiment, we have three sets of crystals in the uh, training set, P1, P1, M, and P2. And then in the testing set, we use a set of crystals which the algorithm has not seen before, P2M. So it's compositionally different from, from any crystal within the training set. Um, and this is kind of the most realistic situation for applying a machine learning model. Um, and as you can see here, the improvement that the PDD provides is much more significant over average minimum distance. Um, so for the materials project, we used MapBench, which is uh, kind of a standardized test suite for, for machine learning models. Um, they have a bunch of different properties, and for each of these properties, uh, a number of crystals, and then they go ahead and divide these crystals into a training and testing set, and they use a uh, five-fold cross-validation. Um, and this way we can compare more fairly between other models that have been previously published. Um, so we decided to... Uh, a comparison with three other models to to kind of uh, have a large range um, of of potential competitors. Uh, the uh, the first model is CrabNet, which is probably the most similar to our model, but uh, with with the exception that it doesn't use any structural information at all. Uh, so it it only has knowledge of the composition of the crystal structure. Uh, the next model is CoGN. Uh, it's a graph neural network which uses multiple line graphs. So the first line graph incorporates angular information. The second line graph incorporates uh, dihedral uh, ang angle information. And this is the current state of the art, um, at, at least at the time of, of publishing uh, the paper. And then uh, Crystal Twins is actually a self-supervised learning model. Uh, so it's a bit different from the other two. Uh, so it uses self-supervised learning to, to learn a representation for a crystal structure. And then these crystals, these uh, representations, typically individual vectors, are then just passed through a simple uh, multi-layer perceptron and then the, the property value spit out. Uh, but this is also kind of a newer approach uh, to, to doing property prediction. So here we can see the mean absolute errors, um, and then the the standard deviation over each of the five folds is given given to the right. Um, so this first uh, column here is our model, um, and uh, as you can see, we come essentially in second place with comparison to to Kogian for for the majority of the properties, though we are very competitive. Um, in some of them. And then for the properties, these specifically, these three refractive index phonon peak and exfoliation energy were actually uh, uh, an improvement over, over Kogian. Um, notably, these actually are the properties that had the fewer number of samples. Um, so uh, our model performs, has a tendency to perform best when when uh, the number of samples is, is fewer. Um, and then CrabNet obviously is, is uh, performs much worse than, than uh, our, our model, um, obviously, because it doesn't have uh, geometric information. It kind of, uh, it's, it's has a significant handicap in, in performance. And then uh, Crystal Twins as well, uh, even though it is a more recently published model, our, our model is able to outperform it across all properties. Um, and here is the training and prediction time between our model and Kogian. So Kogian outperformed us on five out of the eight properties, I believe. 
Um, but if you take a look at training and prediction time, we are significantly faster in both. So for training time, uh, we're about four uh, ish times faster uh, for training. And then in prediction time, we're about five, uh, five times as fast. So more effect, uh, more effective, uh, particularly when there's a lower number of samples again. Um, but I think the more fair comparison is when there are a large number of samples and you really do have to put prediction, uh, but we're about six times faster. Um, then for Jarvis DFT, uh, Cogian did not have uh, results for Jarvis DFT. So instead we used another model, which was uh, state of the art for, for some time in 2022 um, called Matformer. Uh, it also uses a line graph, but it does not incorporate uh, angular information. It uses this line graph for, for just edge to edge attention which in the uh, within the graph it constructs. Um, on top of this, the way Cogian uh, builds its uh, graph representation is based on the asymmetric unit. Um, Matformer uses the entirety of the unit cell. Um, so here we have uh, 12 uh, properties, I believe, from Jarvis DFT. Um, and uh, obviously these, these are more than just the ones provided by, uh, by Mapbench. And we actually outperform Map Performer on, on uh, nearly every property except for um, formation bank gap and total energy. Um, and these will notably have the most number of samples. So again, our model performs the best when there's a lower number of samples, uh, but it's still competitive when, when the number of samples is high, as you can see from, from EHAL. Um, further, uh, there's actually two band gap uh, values here using different functionals, uh, MBJ and then OPT. Um, it's pretty universally agreed upon that MBJ is more accurate, but co more computationally expensive. So the number of samples provided using the MBJ band gap is significantly less than the OPT. But in these uh, band gap predictions, we actually outperform Mathformer. Um, So here is the same comparison that we did with Cochian, but with Matformer. Um, and because Matformer uses the entirety of the unit cell, the graphs are uh, much larger. And obviously because the original graphs are larger, the line graphs will be much, much larger as well. So the improvement on, in training time is closer to uh, around nine times uh, better. And then prediction time is, is vastly, vastly better. Um, and some of this can be attributed to to implementation. Their code could just not be as efficient as possible. But yeah, we are we're essentially a hundred times faster. Uh, and this is the prediction time in seconds across the whole of the test set. Um, so ten percent of the samples, around fifty five hundred samples for for formation energy. Um, and then here we have a comparison between the two types of attention mechanisms that I mentioned before. So the previous experiments were all done with dot product attention. That's the more efficient one, um, but the less uh, the less accurate one. Um, and as you can see here, uh, except for exfoliation energy, uh, vector attention is, is significantly better at producing more accurate results. Uh, that being said, the vector attention version of the model took between one and a half and two times longer to train, and the inference time was about 1.3 times uh, as long. So a non-negligible amount of computational uh, or increase in, in computational effort. Uh, but should the extra accuracy be needed, then this is is an option. Um, and then we did a few ablation studies. So these are all using dot product attention, not vector attention. So in this experiment, we essentially take the, the individual components of the PDD encoding. So you have the, the composition and then the PDD, the, the structural information. Um, and we, we keep one, leave out the other. So in the composition column, we keep the composition, but we do not add in the PDD. Um, in the PDD, we leave out the composition. And then in the PSD, that's that's the full model. And obviously incorporating both the compositional information and the structural information within the PDD provides the best results um, across all properties. Um, in the next experiment, um, we, uh, we change where we keep the PD or where we include the PDD weights. So uh, I mentioned in the overview of the model, the PDD weights are included in two areas, the attention mechanism, and then in the final pooling. Um, and in the first column here, there's 
uh, no weights at all. These weights are important for, for understanding the significance of individual atoms to, to the crystal as a whole. Um, so the use of no weights whatsoever will, will likely result in uh, the worst performance. And that's exactly what we found. We also found that using it within the pooling mechanism is much more important than using it within the attention mechanism. Um, but then obviously the best results come from the inclusion in both areas. Um, and then in the final two uh, ablation studies, we kind of vary the two parameters of PDD encoding. So the collapse tolerance and the number of K nearest neighbors. Um, and it's important to recognize when increasing K, you essentially keep all the information from, from uh, lower K values. So we should expect to see as K increases, eventually it tapers off in, in, in usefulness and, and uh, increasing K just kind of increases the computational effort, doesn't really uh, add to the, the accuracy of the model. And for the most part, that's that's true, particularly on, on uh, the properties that have a large number of samples. Having a higher K is beneficial because you need to be able to discern between many more crystals. Um, uh, for phonon peak here, this is kind of an outlier uh, because it only it got its best performance at, at uh, K equals five. Uh, but I think what's missing here is that these these values, these mean absolute errors are quite insignificant when compared to to the uh, the uh, scale at which uh, the phonon peak values take on, typically within the hundreds. Um, so a difference of, say, 1.5 or 1 uh, is not very significant at all. Um, and then in the final uh, ablation study, we varied the collapse tolerance. So the collapse tolerance, again, is, is the largest difference between K nearest neighbor distances uh, to allow for two, two atoms to be grouped together. So on this left-hand side, we use a collapse tolerance of essentially one angstrom, um, and, which is quite large. Uh, and uh, we can see here that, that for properties that have high uh, number of a high number of samples, band gap and formation energy in particular, this is not a good thing. There's significant information loss when, when you're combining uh, uh, atoms with truly different K nearest neighbor distances. So the worst performance comes when, when the collapse tolerance is high. Um, there are some properties that actually benefit from the use of a high collapse tolerance. Typically, these are ones with with a lower number of samples. Um, but for the most part, altering the collapse tolerance uh, does not greatly impact the results for the majority of the properties, except for those with with a large number of uh, samples. You can see here that the the differences are actually quite minuscule um, across across all collapse tolerance values. So, uh, in conclusion. Uh, the periodic set transformer, our model, can provide prediction results on par with uh, graph neural network models, even those with, with multiple line graphs being used. And it's much more computationally efficient uh, than these graph neural network uh, models in, in, in both training time uh, and prediction time. Um, and yeah, that's it. Does anyone have any Thank questions? Thank you very much, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. I'll stop the recording and uh...